Today we come to the sixth of eight in the sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Today we look at forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Years ago, I was part of an interfaith service on Thanksgiving Eve. For some strange reason, the rabbi in our town was given the Lord's Prayer to lead. Well, this prayer is composed completely of thoughts and elements of Judaic prayer forms. It doesn't appear anywhere in Hebrew scriptures. And clearly, Jesus is not Lord in Judaism. As a student in ministry at the time, I wondered, what would the rabbi do when he delivered this prayer? Taking off his glasses, he looked at us and spoke softly as he leaned in to a room filled with mostly expectant Christian worshipers. He said, now, I know that this is a prayer that you offer to your Messiah, and I know that he gave it to you. It's a beautiful prayer one which I rarely read. I have never actually said it in public before. However, I do know that Christians are both united and very confused about certain words in this prayer. And so before I begin, I just need to know, are you sinners, debtors, or trespassers? We all laugh just like you, right? And I thought to myself, there should be like a D choice, all of the above, right? I mean, we, we, should, be, we should be able to answer that. To speak the obvious, this petition of the Lord's Prayer is all about forgiveness. But of what? When we visit other churches or for guests or new friends among us, we wonder, what our sisters and brothers in Christ will be asking God to forgive. Will it be debts or sins or trespasses when we come to that place in the prayer? <clears throat> Just yesterday, there was a wedding here, and in the wedding, the whole wedding party broke up laughing when I said debts and they all said trespasses. It was, you know, we do that, right? The difference between the English meaning of these words is actually significant. The use of the word trespasses produces a rather odd result. It might make you think of the signs that read, no trespassing. Yesterday, I was out walking and I passed a community where the sign at the entrance said, no trespassing, private community, keep out. Boy, I'm not going back there anytime soon. That's pretty clear, right? No trespassing makes it sound like God is concerned about property rights not to be violated. And I need to hear an amen from all the lawyers in the room. Sins suggests that the primary issue in our life is our sinfulness. Because we are forgiven, we should forgive those who have sinned against us, right? And debt suggests something quite different. Unless we understand it as a metaphor for sins, which most people probably do, but let me be clear, debt is not a synonym for sins. As Marcus Borg says in Speaking Christian, in Matthew and in the Didache, one of the earliest writings of Christian faith, the words used are Greek for debts and debtors. In Luke, the forgiveness petition uses the Greek word for sin in the first half, forgive us our sins, and the word for debt in the second half as we forgive everyone indebted to us. Now, most likely the word used in the first century was debts, and since this petition follows the bread petition, actually debts really meant something. So some of you will be really disappointed, but I'm gonna put trespasses aside and say, don't do that anymore. <laughs> okay, now back to debts. This is really something. Along with the daily challenge of acquiring food, debt was the main peril in peasant life. If a peasant family fell into debt, Failure to repay that debt could result in the loss of their land, if they had any. 
and the loss of everything they owned if they owned anything, or indentured servitude, which was temporary slavery. But I gotta tell you, it's not what it appears. So if I was the one who owed a debt to someone else, my entire family would be enslaved. And the conditions for getting out of that temporary slavery were often lifelong. So debt was a real thing, which happened to entire families. This petition is asking God to forgive what we owe to God as we offer forgiveness of debt for those who owe us. Now this would somehow hearken for some of us to the jubilee, the forgiveness of all debt that comes up in scripture. Think about this. Jesus is teaching a subversive way of acting in this world. He's teaching a kingdom of God value, a way of life. We feed everyone spiritually and physically, and we forgive all debts. No one will go hungry, and no one will be enslaved or become homeless or, or anything that is caused by economic impoverishment. No one will go there. No one will be sleeping outside in this prayer. In forgiveness of sins, we know it's important. Of course it's important. But to think of this petition as simply forgiving sins narrows and domesticates the meaning of the prayer. This petition and this prayer are much more than a domesticated prayer form. Forgiveness, when worked through true re reconciliation, is a powerful and beautiful and transformational act. But most often we treat it like, oh, let bygones be bygones. We've got to dig a lot deeper, much deeper than the three words, sins, debts, and trespasses, and all their significant and powerful meaning is the tough stuff of receiving God's forgiveness and forgiving others. And I would add, forgiving ourselves. So let's go there. Is there something you have done? Someone you have hurt for which you don't feel forgiven by God? Is there someone who has hurt you to whom you do not feel reconciled and whom you have not forgiven. Why are we so troubled by this double-edged sword of forgiveness, which cuts through the pain of continuous resentments and anger? When you reach this place in the Lord's Prayer, do you feel a sense of relief, a sense of release? Do you feel liberated for knowing that God forgives you? Or do you feel judged as you're reminded of your own failings and own inabilities to forgive and thus reawaken in you your own resentments of things that you have not forgiven others. Have you ever gone into an area with briars covering the ground? From a distance, it doesn't look so bad, you know. It looks like you could step gently through it and keep going and walk to the other side. But once you actually step into briars, you realize your pants are caught, if you've got pants that low, <laughs> or your ankles are torn, your feet are torn, your legs are bleeding. We get stuck in the briar patch of our hurt pride, of our poor choices, of our mistakes, of our insults inflicted and received, of our regrets, of our offenses, of our injuries, of our guilt, of our betrayals. We get stuck there. But the briar patches turn out to be the least of our problems. We discover that once we're in this briar patch, beneath us is quicksand that literally sucks us down in. So we move on in and we become entangled in the pain and the stinking, sinking space. Not a good place to be. Forgiveness is our way out of the briar patch and out of the quicksand. It is as if God is cutting away the prickly ground covering and pulling us through to safety on the other side. Forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses. God forgives us. Why can't we forgive one another? God moves on past our screw-ups and failed intentions. Why can't we do that for one another? 
Each one of us gets all caught up in our own egos. Can I forgive? Will I forgive? We get stuck in our own junk. We get into this stinking thinking. In our heads, we replay words like, I was wronged, I was disrespected, I was overlooked, I was forgotten, they picked somebody else, I was unjustly accused, I was unappreciated, I was unrewarded, and I, 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 I. Jesus reminds us that this universe into which we've been born ties every single one of us together. There's actually evidence of this from the creation of the universe. In, in the book we're studying on Wednesdays, there's a belief that at the beginning of the creation of the universe in Judaism that there was a spark, a light put in every single being, every creature, everyone, not just humans, but everyone, and that that God spirit moves between us. So there it is from the beginning. Jesus frees us from our self-absorption in this prayer. Forgive us as we forgive one another. You can choose to suffer by your refusal to forgive. That is a choice. Or you can enter into the awakening force of forgiveness. You can make the choice, too. William Sloan Coffin, in his book Credo, writes, the consequences of the past are always with us, and half the hostilities tearing the world apart could be resolved today were we to allow the forgiveness of sins to alter these consequences. He says, let's go further. All the hostilities in our personal and planetary life could be ended were we to allow the forgiveness of sins to act as a lightning rod grounding all those hostilities. If we were to say to ourselves, the hostilities stop here. In Lewis Smead's book, The Art of Forgiving, When You Need to Forgive and Don't Know How, Dr. Smead does for me and probably many of us what we need. He gives us a roadmap for those of us who aren't good at moving from place to place. He actually lays his book out like this. What do we do when we forgive? Why do we forgive? Whom do we forgive? How do we forgive? At the very end of the book, he brings these words to bear. Forgiving is the only way to heal the wounds of a past we cannot change and cannot forget. Forgiving changes a bitter memory into a grateful memory, changes a cowardly memory into a courageous memory, an enslaved memory into a free memory. Forgiving restores a self-respect that someone killed. And more than anything else, forgiving gives birth to hope for the future after our past illusions have been shattered when we forgive, we bring light where there was darkness. We summon positives to replace the negatives. We open the door to an unseen future that our painful past has shut. When we forgive, we take God's hand. We walk through that door, and we stroll into the possibilities that wait for us to make them real. Remember this, he finishes, forgiving is essential. Talking about it is optional. Think about that. Forgiving is essential. Talking about it is optional. Remember also, when we forgive, we set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner we set free is us. When we forgive, we walk in stride with our forgiving God. None of this is easy. Jesus didn't give us an easy prayer. Forgiveness is not something that we jump into. It's still a briar patch for many of us with quicksand there too. To forgive one another as God has forgiven us can be challenging, it can be tiring, but we need to know we can do it and that we're never alone. I love that Mark reminds us so often when he speaks to us that we are never alone we can seek each other out. We needn't do this as individuals against all the odds. We've got each other. We can talk out the pain and the struggles we face. We can talk about our cynicisms and our doubts. 
Then after talking, we can pray together. We can pray the prayer that Jesus gave us. Pray it as if it were new. Pray it as if you've never prayed it before. Pray it with a deep and abiding sense that this prayer will actually deliver you. Pray it and mean it. God, forgive us as we forgive one another. Amen.